Can you believe it's almost Black Friday? In the U.S., we use this day as a sort of seasonal kickoff when we pivot from fall festivities to December holidays. But Black Friday is just one of the many Black idioms or phrases that have worked their way into our daily lives. So today, we'll look at the history of Friday, sheep, swans, and more as we unpack the Black. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, your friendly guide to the English language. Stick around because after we talk about idioms that use the word black, I have a short story for you about how I was a weirdo, which led to learning about alphabet jokes. It's a fun light show this week, and if you're in the U.S., happy Thanksgiving. Both retailers and shoppers look forward to Black Friday as one of the most exciting shopping days of the year. But although the day after Thanksgiving is the most popular Black Friday today, it wasn't the first Black Friday. The phrase actually dates back to the 17th century, before sales and big shopping sprees, when students called any Friday when there was an exam a Black Friday to express their unhappiness. People have called other Fridays in history Black Friday to recognize dread and panic, too. For example, in 1869, there was a Black Friday, and it wasn't because people were excited to go shopping. On September 24, 1869, the gold market crashed, causing financial distress. People called it Black Friday because of the resulting panic and chaos. We actually first started calling the Friday after Thanksgiving Black Friday when factory workers began calling out from work that day. The truth was they weren't all sick. People just wanted to extend their holiday weekend. Well, instead of being known as a shopping day, it was known for the stress employees caused at work by being absent. Americans began to associate the day with great sales in the 1960s. Philadelphia cops would have long, busy days directing traffic because the city was filled with people starting their holiday shopping. Black Friday started to become even more like what we know it as today when big companies like Walmart became popular in the 1980s. Now, companies that benefit from end-of-year buying often go in the black this time of year, which is an idiom that means to become profitable. Unlike the Black Friday in 1869, which was a day of financial stress, something that's in the black is doing well money-wise. After a long shopping day or paying some bills, people hope their accounts are still in the black. In this case, black comes from the ink accountants used when they did their bookkeeping on paper. They used black ink to record deposits and red to show debits. Thus, red came to be associated with debt, and black came to be associated with profit. It's also why we talk about being in the red when you owe money. Now, most people wouldn't want to be blackballed, especially from their favorite club. To be blackballed is to be ousted or kicked out of an organization or place. That phrase comes from a time when private clubs used secret voting to determine membership. Fraternal clubs, these are clubs for adults that are different from the fraternities you might find on a college campus today. Fraternal clubs were known to use this kind of voting so people wouldn't know who wanted them out of the club. Members would place their vote by dropping either an ivory ball for yes or a black ball for no into a special ballot box made to conceal their hand and their mystery vote. The sound of the ball dropping into the box confirmed that their vote was cast, but nobody would know the results until the box was opened and the results were tallied. Oftentimes, people were kicked out of groups for being a black sheep, or if they didn't seem to mesh with the club. That phrase, black sheep, describes someone who doesn't fit in. The phrase comes from the occasional literal black sheep in a flock of white sheep. Just as that lone black sheep would stand out from the others, a human black sheep is someone who strays from the norm or is the odd one out. The Oxford English Dictionary shows that people first used black sheep in a negative sense in the 1600s, when a minister from New England used black sheep to describe people like drunkards and liars. 
Today, we might use the phrase to describe a family member who's different from the others or who has been ostracized. However, some people see being a black sheep as good or a badge of honor because it means the person goes against social norms or is true to their beliefs. Unlike black sheep, which refers to a person, the phrase black swan typically describes an event. A black swan event is an unpredictable situation that has severe outcomes. It's unlikely and completely unexpected, so you can't prepare for it. The idiom became popular because of the book The Black Swan by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, and like in the black, a black swan event is a common finance term that refers to an event that negatively affects the financial markets. Similar to black sheep, black swans are uncommon and rare because most swans, like sheep, are white. The metaphorical use of the phrase black swan goes all the way back to Roman times and even then referred to a rare event. In fact, it referred to an impossible event because at the time, people didn't think black swans existed. Black swans were eventually found in Australia in the 1600s, and over time, the phrase came to describe something improbable or unexpected instead of something impossible. Moving on, if something is sold on the black market, you probably can't get it at the mall. A black market is a place where people illegally buy and sell, let's say, an array of products. People use black markets to buy something that can't be sold in regular stores, probably for good reason. For example, you can find things like weapons and drugs on the black market. The term first popped up in The Economist in 1931, referring to an unofficial money exchange in Britain. Black markets aren't always used to obtain only dangerous or obscure products, though. People also buy on the black market to avoid taxes or government regulations. In fact, black markets have thrived during wars because laws and regulations can become stricter during these times. For example, during the Civil War, Confederate soldiers could buy coffee, salt, and shoes on the black market from sympathizers. And during World War II, many people in the U.S. bought black market meat and gasoline, which were both in short supply. For example, according to the Department of Agriculture, quote, 20% of all meat found its way into the black market, unquote. Around the 2000s, people also started using the phrase black market to describe online forums where people could buy stolen information like credit card information. You may have heard of the dark web, a subset of the deep web that allows users to communicate and do business anonymously. It requires a specific browser, is intentionally hidden, and hosts digital black markets and other anonymous forums to buy forbidden items mentioned earlier, and lots more. Like black markets, the dark web is a place where people can buy things they wouldn't find on Amazon. If you lived in the Middle Ages and needed something forged, you'd call a blacksmith. We've all heard the name before, but we don't typically know its counterpart, the whitesmith. Blacksmiths and whitesmiths are craftspeople who forge different objects out of metal. According to Edam Online, the word smith comes from the Old English word smith or smid, which means blacksmith, armorer, one who works with metal, or more broadly, handicraftsman, practitioner of skilled manual arts. Black and white are used in the name to specify the type of element the person works with. Iron was called a black metal because of how fast the color formed once it was put in fire. Blacksmiths mostly work with iron. Whitesmiths, on the other hand, work with quote-unquote white metals like tin and are known more for their polishing work. A blacksmith's most common job was farriery, and you can bet I had to look up how to pronounce that. The most common job was farriery, making footwear for horses, like horseshoes. You'd go to them for any general repairs, like a wagon or farm equipment. Blacksmiths started to decline in the 19th century as machines and factories began to make metal products, and they also had less work as people stopped using horses for farming and transportation. Pitch black is a phrase you'd use when it's late at night and you can't see two feet in front of your face. This idiom has a short and easy definition, absolute darkness. 
Pitch dark or pitch black describes a complete lack of light. The original phrase, dark as pitch, refers to the dark, sticky residue that comes from the distillation of tar. Something as dark as pitch resembles the dark color of the tar. Pitch black was first used by John Marston in The Scourge of Villainy, 1598, where he wrote about a dark roof covered in pitch. The phrase is used again in literature by Daniel Defoe in 1704 to describe a storm that hit London. Quote, Great mischief was done in the night, which was so pitch dark that of above 80 ships that then rid in the Humber. Unquote. The boats actually crashed into the harbor because they couldn't see in the dark. As Black Friday approaches, try not to go into the red. Black Friday definitely isn't a black swan event because everyone can predict how wild the day will be. So enjoy all those great deals. But set yourself a budget so you can stay in the black. And hey, if you're the black sheep of the family, maybe you can skip the shopping altogether. That segment was by Julia DiGeronimo, a recent graduate and a freelance writer from northern New Jersey. I got caught off guard recently when a customer service rep asked me to spell my name again after she got it wrong a couple of times. She wanted me to go letter by letter with examples, which is a completely reasonable request because my name is difficult and it can be hard to hear the difference between M's and N's on the phone. But my mind went blank and I started coming up with the strangest words. M as in Mary. Okay, that was a normal start. I as in ice, sure, you know, that works. G as in generous, and now I'm thinking, oh my God, why did I say that? N as in Neanderthal, I mean, I was, I, I don't even know. And finally, O as in orangutan. Now, I had actually looked up the spelling of the word earlier in the day, so that one made sense to me, if not to her. And then another N is for Neanderthal. And I can just imagine this poor customer service rep getting off the phone and laughing about me in some office slack called Weird Callers or something like that. But then I got curious about alphabets like this. I know there's a standard one, and it's called the NATO Phonetic Alphabet. This is what my name sounds like if you explain the spelling with that. M is in Mike, I is in India, G is in golf, N is in November, O is in Oscar, and N as in November. That is actually the official alphabet code that's widely used by people who need to communicate by telephone or radio like pilots. It's technically called a radio telephony spelling alphabet. And it assigns each letter of the alphabet to a word that can't be confused with any of the other words, even in bad conditions and among speakers of different languages. Here's another example. H is hotel, A is alpha, and T is tango. So if you're a pilot and you want to spell hat, it's hotel alpha tango. The NATO alphabet emerged after World War II, and it's gone through a few revisions and extensive testing, and it replaced earlier spelling alphabets that people found more confusing, maybe like my weird random choices. And it turns out spelling like this actually has been comedy fodder for decades. There's a song by the Bare Naked Ladies called Crazy ABCs, where all the words are bad phonetic choices. I know what you mean by what G you for gnarly, I for irk, H is for hour, J for jalapeno, good in either corn or flour, tortillas, nice rhyme. And there's a classic Simpsons scene where the cops are in hot pursuit, shouting out bizarre words to spell the car's license plate. Let's roll. One is from Tango. We are in pursuit of a speeding individual driving a red car. License number eggplant Xerxes crybaby overbite narwhal. There's even a Jack Parr skit from all the way back in the 60s where a telephone operator is tormenting a caller. That's a little longer, but I'll put a link in the show notes. But apparently, I don't have to feel like a complete weirdo, or at least not alone in my weirdness. 
A former customer service rep who goes by Pumpkin Spice Latte on Mastodon said it happens all the time. Quote, we're totally used to weird alphabetical associations, unquote. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Finally, I have a family story from Andrea. Hi, Mignon. This is Andrea. I called in once before, but it's been years, so here's another one. I have two things for you. First, I'm so grateful for your podcast. I love writing, editing, proofing, rewriting, anything like that. My job doesn't require that for me, but I just like doing it on the side. When people hear that I, one of my favorite podcasts is all about grammar, they know to take me seriously. And I've been able to edit almost everything that goes out of our office. The second thing I have is a family story. My family is late for everything. And I'm going to credit this family story to us always being on the run. Instead of saying something like, goodbye, I love you, we shorten it. Bye, love you. And something like, "Good night, I love you. We shorten that to night love you. And it's funnier the faster that you say it. Thanks, Andrea. Good job at the office and thanks for the story. And it just occurred to me, if you get together with your family for Thanksgiving this week, talk about your family acts. It's the perfect time. And then pick your favorite and give me a call. The number is 833214-GIRL. It's in the show notes and it's in my email newsletter every week. And be sure to tell me the story behind your family act, because that's always the best part. Grammar Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. Thanks to my audio engineer, Nathan Sims, digital operations specialist, Holly Hutchings, marketing associate, Davina Tomlin, marketing assistant, Cameron Lacey, director of podcasts, Brandon Getches, and ad operations specialist, Morgan Christensen, who was born with red hair. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening.